So glad that you're here with us today. My name is Dave. I'm one of the pastors here at Sedaris. And let me just add a welcome to Ryan's welcome. This is a, this is a big day for us. If you're new to Sedaris, we're really excited that you're here. On February 11th, we will celebrate our three-year anniversary. We'll do a big party. It'll be fun. For those of you who uh, really enjoy Dick's Hamburgers, it's no longer quite as easy to, to walk outside the church and grab a hamburger, so you're welcome for that. <laughs> it is that time of year, our first service of the new year, so it's important to say Happy New Year. If you haven't already given up on your New Year's resolutions, congratulations, you've made it a full week, better than most, uh, but just to be Honest and fair with you, research tells us that 80% of people will give up by the second week in February, so enjoy it while it lasts. Uh, but New Year's resolutions, even though they're very difficult to keep, they're not all bad, they're important because they do a couple things. They remind us that there is possibility for a more satisfying life, a more full life, that there's something missing, right? That's why we make resolutions. We, we realize that there's something more some fuller life, some more meaning, more happiness, more purpose, and so we, we try to resolve to find ways to get there. So I don't think we're deceiving ourselves. I think there's actually more there. I think there's more to life, a more satisfying life, and even though only 10% of Americans will succeed in keeping their New Year's resolutions, if you're in that 10%, if you're spectacular, and you might be, you might work for Amazon, congratulations. Glad you're here. <laughs> Be renting the rest of my life, but that's okay. I'm okay with that. I love to rent. Um, if you're in the top 10% and you do keep your resolutions, let me just tell you what's going to happen. You're going to realize at the end of the year that what you thought that resolution would bring to your life isn't going to be everything you thought it would bring. It will, it will fall short you will still have part of yourself that's unsatisfied. That's just what's going to happen. But it's not a waste, again, because you learn something valuable. You'll learn that you need to look somewhere else beyond a resolution to bring you that satisfaction that you so long for. So with that said, if you turn in your Bible to Mark chapter 6, we're going to go ahead and, and pick up where we've been, a sermon series we've been doing in the Gospel of Mark if, if you don't have a Bible, there's some on the end of the rows. You can just ask the person at the end to pass it down to you. Feel free to bring out your phone and Google Mark 6. We're going to be reading a story. It might be a familiar story to you, but we're about halfway through uh, this book of the Bible, which is called The Gospel According to Mark. Let's give you a little background if, if you're new with us. Uh, the Gospel According to Mark was written by a guy named John Mark. And John Mark was a traveling companion and sort of a personal assistant to Peter. And Peter was one of the 12 disciples, one of the apostles that walked with Jesus during his life, was, was sort of his right-hand man. And so he had first-hand eyewitness experience of the things Jesus did and the things Jesus said. And so as, as Peter was getting older, John Mark realized these things needed to be recorded so that if and when Peter died, it would not be lost. That we even today could come and read a firsthand account of the life and teachings of Jesus. So that's what we've been doing. We've been looking at these accounts, the deeds, the sayings of Jesus. And, and, and what we find, what we're challenged with even today, and this letter was written to uh, Christians in Rome at the time, where Peter was doing his ministry to challenge them and encourage them to continue to move forward with the mission of the Jesus movement. And it challenges us today. And there's one central question right at the middle of the book. And it's a question that Jesus actually asked Peter himself. And Jesus asked Peter this. He says, who do you say that I am? And what we've realized, this, that we've been saying this, and this is the title of our series, this is the most important question ever asked in human history. And it's a question that Jesus continues to ask of each and every man and woman that's lived since. Who do you say that I am? Jesus asks us that question 
today. And so as we walk through this book, and, and we've been doing this, we've been considering together the things Jesus has done, the things that he said, in order that we might get a fresh view, a, a, a new consideration of maybe some really old stories that we've heard from growing up, or maybe they're brand new to us, but for all of us, a brand new look at Jesus that maybe we could answer with this insight the most important question ever asked for ourselves. So that's what we're doing. And we pick up the story right here in Mark chapter 6, starting in verse 30. So I'm going to go ahead and read it. First verse says this, The apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. Now, let me pause there for a second. Three very important words that start this section. The first word is apostles. Let me explain what that is. An apostle is a messenger or representative of Jesus who has been con- commissioned directly by Jesus to go out and to preach Jesus' message. They're given the authority of Jesus to do what Jesus has done. The second word you see there is return. Now, where were they returning from? They were returning from doing the work of Jesus. Jesus has, right before this, sent them out into the villages, and they were to go village by village, doing what Jesus has been doing, teaching what he's been teaching, that the kingdom has come. They've been healing people. They've been casting out oppressive spirits, and they've been bringing the good news of the kingdom come. Now what's interesting about this word return is is in the Greek it's synago, which is the same word that that we use to talk about the Jewish meeting place, or which is the synagogue. And so to return to synago means to be gathered together. And this is a passive term, and that's important too, because it's Jesus that, that calls these 12 disciples from the work they've been doing and tells them to return to gather together, and to come into community. This is where we get the word church from the the Jewish idea of the synagogue. So Jesus calls them to synagogue together after the work that they've been doing. And why does he do that? Well, look at verse 31 and following. And he said to them, the apostles, come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. For there were many coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. This is such an important part, and so I just want to pause on it for a second. Each and every one of us who is a disciple of Jesus is called to do the same thing that the first disciples were. Jesus will send us out to do his work, to bring healing, to bring the message. And you know what? It's tiring work. And so then he'll call us back to synagogue together. He'll gather us together that we might rest from the work that we've been doing. This is the local church. This is what we want to be about. All disciples of Jesus need rest because they're doing the work of Jesus all week long. So we do that here at Sedaris, and uh, we hope that this is a place that you find rest We call it sometimes a centering community. It's not the only community that you participate in. Uh, There's many communities, but it's right at the center. And so you come, and you get rejuvenated, refreshed, built up, and then you're sent back out. That's sort of the rhythms of life for the disciples, and you see this with the original disciples. Now, the other thing that you notice is that the church never becomes the end-all, be-all. Jesus calls them, and they're going to get on a boat, And they're going to go to the other side of the lake. And guess what? The rest is over. And Jesus is going to say, go back to work. Very important that we as Christians don't become so entrenched, so separated from our other communities that we miss being on mission. That's such an important part of what the church is. It's a place to come together and and be refreshed so that we might go back out. And you see this happen. So look at verse 33 and 34. It says this. "So, So they've hopped on a boat to a desolate place by themselves. Now, many saw them going and recognized them, and they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. And when they went ashore, he saw a great crowd 
he saw a great crowd. This is what always happens. We come and we find community and family. And we can be ourselves and we can be known and it's great. And then you know what? We're going to realize there's broken people. A new sea of broken people. And in this story we'll see there's, there's over 5,000 of them who have come to Jesus. And so Jesus will then send the apostles back to work. Back into the fray. Back on mission. To the hurt, the sick, the lost. Because his heart is full of compassion. So let's read what happens. When he was ashore, verse 34, he saw a great crowd, and Jesus had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. And then it grew late, and his disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place, and the hour is now late. Send them away to go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy for themselves something to eat. And Jesus answered them, you give them something to eat. And they said to him, shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? And Jesus said to them, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they had found out, they said, five loaves and two fish. When he commanded them all, then he commanded them all to sit in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups by hundreds and by fifties, and taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven, he said a blessing, he broke the loaves, and he gave them to the disciples to set before the people. And he divided the two fish among them all, and they all ate and were satisfied, and they took up twelve baskets full of pieces and fish. Those who ate the loaves were 5,000 men. Now, when Mark says 5,000 men, probably just because it was the custom of the day, he's just excluded this, in, this huge group of women and children as well. So it's probably way more than 5,000. You might think 10,000. We don't know exactly. At least 5,000, probably way more. That's a lot of people. And they brought with them nothing at all. They just, it's like the first Woodstock. They just came out of nowhere. They didn't bring anything. And, and, and that's kind of nuts, right? This is sort of, it, it's foolish. But it shows the hearts of desperation, so you've got to imagine, what kind of person is it that comes long distances by foot to see Jesus? It's somebody who is desperate, in need. I also think, think that it shows us that these people have some sort of a seed of faith in them. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about that. That there, there is this gift that's given to us by God. It's, it's the seed of faith. And for some reason, we find ourselves trusting Jesus in a moment of desperation. We're not even sure why often at first, but we come to him. This is a sign that we have a seed of faith, that in a moment of desperation, we look for Jesus, and we look to trust him. This is what the 5,000 plus were doing. Now, now don't hear me wrong. It's illogical. It's even foolish to the natural mind, the mind without faith. Why would they do this? We don't know. But it's probably because something is drawing them to Jesus. It's also illogical what many of you in the room are doing to come to Jesus. I mean, they were coming to a man who in their time in history, reports were coming out of him performing miracles, healing the sick, the lame were walking, the blind were seeing, demons were being cast out of people, and it still took faith for them to come and see, but think about us 2,000 years later, removed from the actual events, and we come to Jesus kind of makes sense what 
Jesus himself says when he tells his disciples, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. That's you, that's me. But regardless, these 5,000 come to Jesus with nothing except a deep, probably mysterious, unexplainable drawing, and they respond to that drawing, and they come to him, and they get to see Jesus perform a miracle, and they get to see him prove that he is God in the flesh. And so on that day, their seed, whatever brought them to, their seed grows because Jesus reveals himself once again, just like he did in the storm for the disciples when he calms the wind with his mere words. He does it here when he creates bread from heaven. He's proven to the people who came near to him that he is who he said he was. Um, I just love the fact that, that these disciple or the, these five thousand, they came with nothing. I, I I I have been sick as a dog all week long. You can probably hear it in my voice. Um, just really not feeling good. And uh, actually, I was writing this illustration because I'm going to tell you why being sick as a dog can be a blessing. Uh, but I was writing, I wrote sick as a dog, and I was like, why do we say sick as a dog? <laughs> I was like, i got to figure this out and make sure I'm not saying it wrong. And it's interesting, isn't it? What do you mean sick as a dog? So I looked it up, and here, here's what I found out. First recording we have of this is back in 1705. And at that time, dogs weren't, you know, man's best friend. They weren't one in every other household kind of a thing. And uh, usually, you'd encounter dogs in the streets. They were usually strays, and uh, they didn't always hold up so well. If you've, you know, met many dogs, you know, they need a lot of attention. Otherwise, they become unclean. And so dogs had actually become sort of associated with disease and misfortune, (laughs) and they, they... They just looked kind of sickly, right? I mean, just imagine that cute dog face, you know, those eyes, right? Just imagine that. But now imagine it's associated with smells that aren't the best and disease and misfortune. And now you can start to see why people would blame them for getting sick. That's why they'd say you're sick as a dog. Now that same face outside of the comfort of a warm and loving home becomes disheveled, sickly. These were the disease wanderers of of the old times. And you can just picture this, right? I mean, all you got to do is add a little Sarah McLaughlin, and you've got a very lucrative fundraising campaign. Because dogs just have that look, you know? And that was me this week. I looked like a Sarah McLaughlin commercial and thought about doing some fundraising at that moment. Maybe that's why you're here, to support me because you heard I was sick. Thank you for being here. Uh, But I realized as I was researching what sick as a dog means, um, this, this line that's in this passage, you know, just jumped out at me. Jesus saw them and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Sheep without a shepherd is like a stray dog without a loving owner. When Jesus looked out at these people, that's what he saw. He saw a bunch of sick dogs, and he had compassion on them. He didn't blame them. He didn't turn them away. He wasn't repulsed. He had compassion because they were sheep without a shepherd. That was me and Grayson all week long, sick and sadly. My son is Grayson, by the way. 
And uh, he took it a lot better than I did, because another old adage is very true, the bigger they come, the harder they fall. And so this little two and a half year old is just, you know, he, he, he got a little bit ornery, but took it like a champ, and I'm just, I'm just a mess. I was, uh, to turn another phrase, I was a real sore sight for good eyes, and I've never been proud of the fact that when I get sick, I, I become just, <laughs> well, you talk to my wife after, <laughs> after the service, it's just not pretty. But the odd, uh, odd thing happens in that moment. Every time I get sick, it's like this. The oddest thing happens that, that when I get really sick, it puts me in this prime position for my faith to grow. And, and it happened again this week. And, and, and why is that? I think what happens is, is when I get sick, I realize uh, that this tiny microscopic organism can bring all six foot two Norwegian Scottish hybrid to his knees in an instant. Just this tiny microscopic organ. You know how humbling that is? It's extremely humbling. And so if I'd ever thought, you know, I was all that in a bag of chips, I realize in that moment that if I'm anything, it's just a bag of chips. And I need that. I also realize that death crouches at my door because if this bug were just a little bit more potent, a little bit more powerful, it could take me down all the way. I mean, this thing took me to the brink. Another bug could take me out. And then I realize I'm not a rock, I'm not an island, but I'm desperately dependent on other people in my life, my wife, my family, my friends, all of you who make Sedaris happen. I was just so reminded of that this week because I couldn't do what I normally do. And of course, I realize how desperately dependent I am on God. And so I stand here, not triumphant, but stumbling in the side door. And I came in the side door because there's no steps. <laughs> and I walk in, and um, this is a big day for us. I mean, this is a huge day in the history of our church. And, and, I, and I come in, you know, crashing. I didn't bring anything with me. I've got nothing to give you. I just come in here and point you to Jesus. But my faith is strong, even though my body is weak. And so for that reason, as I stand here, sick as a dog, I realize I'm not astray. I have an owner. I have a loving master who gives me the energy I need to keep standing, to keep preaching, to keep proclaiming the gospel, even though I don't feel like I could. And so I'm reminded of this every time I get sick. Maybe you're like that. Maybe you've come in. Maybe 2017 was a hard year, and you feel like you've come with nothing to offer. You've come to the right place. This is a place where you don't have to bring anything with you. You just come as you are, brokenness. Maybe you feel like a stray. Maybe you feel like a sheep without a shepherd. You've come to the right place. Because in this place is the spirit of Jesus. The spirit of the living God is here in this middle school right now. And he wants to meet you where you're at and give you what you need. Not because you have something to offer him, but just because you came near. So I give thanks to God that he took me down this week, made me sick as a dog so that I could remember, and, and this is so hard to remember in our American society where we have so much power and wealth and opportunity and education, it's so hard to remember that I have to come to him with empty hands. I needed that reminder. In whom do I trust? In whom do I believe? in whose power must I be filled. So look at verse 35 again. The 5,000, they get it. They've come with nothing. But as often is the case in the Gospel of Mark, the disciples, those who have seen Jesus do the things that he's done firsthand, 
they struggle to get it. And so they, this huge crowd, nothing to eat, and the disciples come, and they say this. Jesus, it's a desolate place. The hour is now late. You should send them all away into the, into the countryside, into the villages around us, to buy themselves something to eat. Translation, it's not our problem. Let's let them fend for themselves. So Jesus shows this dense dozen, as I like to call them, once again, that when people come to him in faith, he never turns them away. He never turns them away and says, figure it out on your own. He never turns them away and says, fend for yourself. And this is what I love about this story. This, this is a beautiful illustration of how grace works. And grace is one of these words that gets thrown around all the time. Sometimes it's misused, sometimes it's misunderstood. And so I want to use this story to try to explain to you what grace actually is. There's an equation. And you see it in the story, and it goes like this. Remember, they bring nothing, absolutely nothing, except their suffering, their sickness, and their deep need. And here's the equation. Bring that big nothing, add Jesus' heart of compassion, and here's what you get. Full satisfaction with leftovers. That is the grace equation. And you see it in this story. Now, this satisfaction in this story is a physical hunger that is satisfied by the eating of real fish and real bread. Uh, but this is just one manifestation of how grace works because God gives grace in all sorts of ways. This is just an example of, of, of everything that Jesus can do. And Jesus will actually later say this very thing. He'll say, uh, you know, remember when I did that with the bread? He says, well, I'm actually the bread of life. I give you full, encompassing, holistic satisfaction for anyone who takes me into their life. If you find life in me, Jesus says, your satisfaction won't run out by the next meal time, won't run out when your blood alcohol level balances out, it won't, won't run out when you crawl into your own bed the next morning, it won't crawl out when you tear your ACL, and it won't call out, run out on the last day of your working career. It just doesn't run out. It's a different kind of satisfaction. It's deep and profound satisfaction with never-ending leftovers. That's grace. And it can't be bought, can't be bartered, it can't be borrowed. It's a gift from a compassionate God. So the pragmatic world, they'll say this to you. They'll say, okay, there's no free lunch. Find yourself something to eat. Grace will cry out from the wilderness. Come to Jesus, eat and be filled. The pragmatic world will, will, will say to you, if you want salvation and forgiveness, you'd better work hard that your good outweighs your bad. Grace cries out. While you were still sinning, Jesus broke his body and he spilt his blood for your forgiveness that you might be saved. The pragmatic world will tell you the pie is fixed, so distribute it wisely or you'll run out. Grace cries out. The baker has not left the building. There's always an abundance. There's always an overflow for those who come by faith. It's a free gift. It's not earned that no one might boast. There's no strings attached that you might lose it. It's not fixed so that any who desire it are not left out in the cold. Isn't grace marvelous? So why doesn't everyone have it? Why doesn't everybody experience the satisfaction that comes by grace alone? I'll tell you why. And it has to do with the distribution system that God has chosen for grace. And we see this distribution system at work in this story. So I'm going to explain it to you. I'm going to explain it to you by telling you about the Coca-Cola company. Everybody heard of the Coca-Cola company? Small Small company based in Atlanta, Georgia. Shout out to 
the Bulldogs. Come on. According to the official statistics, 1.9 billion Coca-Cola products are sold around the world every single day. And apparently the term Coke is, second, is the second most well-known term around the world to the term OK. I just found that out. Uh, so like almost every community and culture around the world, if you go in and say Coke, they'll be like, ah, the real thing, yeah. So on their website, Coke is very proud to say this, we are a global business that operates on a local scale. And, and this is actually true. This is how it works. Let me explain to you how Coke works. Now, Coca-Cola Corpora is in Atlanta, uh, but it is just one of hundreds of entities, separate legal entities that have to do with the distribution of Coke. And so, so what you have is Coca-Cola Corporate creates the concentrate, which then they send out to over 250 bottling entities, which are separate legal managerial entities that then take the concentrate, they add water, they put it in the bottles that they make, they fizz it up, screw on the top, package it, and send it out on their trucks. And then retailers get these bottles, they put them in their stores, in their restaurants, in their vending machines, in the grocery stores, and it's those retailers that then get to hand you and deliver 1.9 billion products each and every day around the world. That's how Coca-Cola works. And, and, and it's fascinating uh, because actually on their website, they, they admit to this, uh, that they stole this idea from God. No, that's not true. I, made that up. <laughs> I had some of you. I was looking. You're like, oh, my gosh. But let's assume for a second, and it's not a big stretch, that God the Father lives in Atlanta, Georgia. It's not a huge stretch. Grace begins with the Father. And in the Father who is in heaven, it is an unconsumable yet perfect, concentrated grace. But we can't get to it. It'd kill us. We, could, we literally couldn't handle it to just drink the concentrate. So God sends this concentrate out into the world in the person of God the Son who takes on or takes with him all the fullness of that grace and he puts it into a form, into a package that can be tangibly received by human beings. And then that real thing that is now in the flesh that we, we, can, we can grab hold of and understand it's given out to the world by the disciples who had nothing to do with its creation. But they get the privilege to hand you grace. Let me break that down just in case you didn't grab that. Look at verse 41. Look at verse 41. Verse 41 says this. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he, that's Jesus, looked up to heaven and he said a blessing and he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples who set them before the people. He takes the loaves and he looks to the Father in heaven and he says, multiply this. Create new grace for these people. Now, we don't know what that looks like. Was it like a Dragon Ball Z sort of hand dance as he's making the, <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it's like he's like the crazy uncle who's just pulling breads and loaves from behind your ears and be just like, oh, I don't know where these came from. Like, he probably did all of it. We don't know how it worked, scientifically speaking. We just know that by the end of it, there were 12 baskets full of fish and bread at the end. There's a lot of things that God does that we don't scientifically understand, including the incarnation of God the Son into the world in the person of Jesus. But the pattern is always clear. Uh, that God is not some far off, removed, distant entity. He's not some wish granter, but he enters into the real, tangible, material world, and he always does it through the second person of the triune Godhead, God the Son, who is Jesus. 
He did this when Jesus was born in a little village in the Middle East, a town called Bethlehem, when he took on the fullness of, of life in God and he puts on the flesh of humanity and he makes the physical world and the world of God connected. And it's through Jesus. And now God is visible and touchable and tangible and understandable to us. And he does it on every variety and type of grace in his repertoire, and it's, and it's vast. He makes it available to humanity, but it's always and only through Jesus. It flows through Jesus. And so we pray in the name of Jesus for every grace that we ask of God, and he wants to give us good gifts, but it's always through Jesus that he gives us that, because Jesus makes God's grace, real, tangible, and usable. That's his thing. That's what he does. Now here comes my favorite line in the whole story. Look back up in in verse 37. It says this, but he answered them. (laughs) So they say, "Uh, well, how are we supposed to feed them? And Jesus looks at them and says, you give them something to eat. You give them something to eat. That's that's funny, because they're like, what? But it's true. That's what's so crazy. Jesus will ask us to do really funny, outrageous things. But it actually is his plan. It's his master plan to make his grace made available in Jesus, made tangible in Jesus. It's his plan to distribute that into real people's hands, wanting, waiting, dog-sick people by the disciples, by anyone in this room who calls himself a disciple of Jesus. His desire is global, but his means are local. He wants to reach the entire world, and his plan is to do it through you and me. So you don't have to travel to heaven to receive God's grace, or Atlanta, or Bethlehem, or Nazareth, or Jerusalem. God will bring it to you. He'll bring it into your neighborhood, into your favorite restaurant, into your place of work. He'll bring it to your college campus. He'll bring it to your office break room, to your high school dance party. He'll even bring it to your front door at the next party that you throw. He'll bring it right in the front door through this mass distribution network of disciples who are given the Holy Spirit when they receive by faith salvation in Jesus. If you have received by faith, by faith salvation that comes in Jesus, you now carry with you the real thing. You are not the real thing, but you carry with you the real thing. And it's your job to walk up to somebody who is thirsty and hungry and say, here, this is the only thing that will satisfy you. It's pretty amazing It's a great privilege, and it's a massive responsibility. The final thing I'll say is this. Look at what Jesus says in verse 39. He says, hey, go get in groups of 50 and groups of 100. He commands them to do it, and they listen because they've got the seed of faith, and so they just obey Jesus, and they get in groups, and because they listen, they get Grace. Because for some reason, God has designed the world, just like he did for the disciples at the beginning of this passage. He says, synagogue together, come together. It's important. He tells these 5,000, you need to get into groups. You need to get into smaller communities that you might experience grace in the context of community. That's God's plan too. That's why the local church exists, because that's how God has always decided to distribute his grace. It just works better in the context of community. And so they get in their groups and they wait. Who who knows? I mean, just picture the disciples frantically running to and from Jesus, getting more fish. It's 10,000 people. took a while. And so they patiently wait in their groups of 50 and groups of 100 for the grace to arrive. Because you cannot take grace. You can only receive it. And it comes to them, and they eat, and they are filled, and they are satisfied. My hope is in 2018, 
You experience grace. You don't just know how it works. You don't just hear about it, but that you truly experience a grace. Knowing that you didn't buy it because God's grace is free. Knowing that it touched you in a deep, meaningful way because God's grace is satisfying. And knowing that you didn't and you don't have to chase it with something else because God's grace is enough in and of itself. And that you don't feel like you have to ration it because there's always more where it came from. God's grace is abundant. If you've never experienced grace in that way, you can. No one's beyond God's grace. No one's too far gone. If you desire it, you will not be separated from it. As we've moved into this new space, our heart's longing, our our motivation is that God's grace becomes more and more accessible to this city. There are people that are dying, that are sheep without shepherd, that are dog sick. And they have nothing to offer. They need to know that they can come here and receive God's grace. So we've made some changes to make that more accessible to them. And I challenge you, what changes in your own life do you need to make that the people God has placed in your path, that the grace that you hold in your hand becomes more accessible to them? Don't withhold God's grace. Give it away freely. Let's pray. God, we pray that all those who are a sheep without a shepherd would come be drawn to your son Jesus and that they would find a shepherd, that they would find a loving father who would take them into his family that they might eat their fill, that they might be satisfied in a deep, profound way like never before. We pray for our city. We pray for the hundreds of thousands of people who do not know the grace of God. That through our little community, that through the individuals in this room, they might have access to the real thing. In Jesus, by the Spirit, in whose name we pray, amen.